I don't know if I need to go to go through the introduction, but for people who you, who don't know me, my name is Akshay Sura. I've been an MVP for quite a few years. I've been uh, part of the Sitecore community and building it. So anyone needs anything, just let me know. Uh, today we'll be talking about Sitecore Experience Edge, uh, being able to deliver content at scale. So Sitecore has launched a new product called Sitecore Experience Edge. Uh, the idea is that it'll take your content, push it to the CDN Edge network so that it's reachable by any of the channels which you choose to deploy your applications on. It's fast because it's globally distributed by default. It scales by default. So from an architectural and infrastructural uh, perspective, things are much more easier and seamless. Uh, they released the Content Hub version of the Sitecore Experience Edge in February, on February 9th. Uh, the experience management is yet to be released. So with the XM, technically, you are supposed to be able to push content out as well onto the Sitecore Experience Edge, query it via, uh, via the GraphQL endpoint, and serve it on whichever system you choose to, whether it's um, you know a static site or you have like a POS system which is pulling content, whatever that is, you should be able to do that. Um, from what we know, based on the work we do with the uh, Content Hub team, personalization won't be released in release one uh, for the XM piece, even when it's released, uh, but it's supposed to come in and I don't know how the box ever uh, part of it comes into play uh, with the set core XM part. So that's something to think about. Uh, again, I'm not going to read through the whole slide, but typically having content on the edge gives you it's faster, it's easier, it's highly performant, and you can scale like crazy. Pretty much use any platform to connect to it. Um, from a delivery perspective, the way it works is once your content is deemed uh, being able to push to the experience edge, it gets pushed on to the CDNs. You can uh, connect to it via the, any GraphQL endpoint. So if your app or the device you're using is capable of making web-based calls, you should be able to pull these content. And we've pretty much tested it quite a bit. The speed is pretty performant. We are on a development instance when we are running these tests and they seem to be pretty fast. So we are actually surprised of how fast things get to it. It takes about 10 to 15 seconds for content once you get it to the final state where it's um, eligible to get to the experience edge to be on the edge and be available, which is pretty consistent with all the other headless uh, systems out there in play. There's two kinds of APIs. Uh, there is a delivery API and a preview API. Uh, the delivery API only has content which is for lack of a better word, published or uh, content which is ready for consumption. Preview API has all other. So the best way we can think about it is delivery API is uh, the web database and preview API is the master. So you get access to pretty much anything. Um, both are two separate endpoints which you would hit in order for you to pull the data from there. Uh, the GraphQL endpoint is pretty simple. I'm, depending on um, if you guys have used GraphQL in the past or not. This is a standard GraphQL playground, which everyone has access to. If you've built a GraphQL endpoint, um, GraphQL by itself is self-documenting. As you're building a GraphQL endpoint, providing the entities and the objects inside of it, you're at the same time documenting the um, API itself which is the best part of a GraphQL endpoint. Uh, so the docs, so I, you don't really need to know anything before you start looking into this in terms of, you know, how do I call the API? You need a token. Um, I hit half of it so you don't see the whole thing, but you need a token obviously to authenticate. You need to know which GraphQL endpoint you're going to hit, either preview or the delivery. Uh, and then you write your queries. To write your queries, again, you do not need any prior knowledge of 
GraphQL, to be extremely honest. Uh, all you have to do is look at the documentation. So for instance, I want to pull all products. So I'm looking for something which is of product or you could search for product and then it'll kind of show you what you're looking for. Uh, once you pick uh, the kind of entity you want to pull, it's basically telling me, hey, this guy is a collection. It's pretty easy to look at it. So it's a collection of uh, m.pcm.product. And again, if you've used Content Hub in the past, you should know the entities. We'll take a look at the Content Hub part of it really quickly. Um, so results has a collection of product. Each product has a bunch of attributes, as you can see. And I want to pull all the assets. So I click on you know, assets, for instance, and it will tell me, OK, this is a collection of m.asset. Asset has a bunch of attributes. So you could pretty much do anything you like in it. Everything is type ahead. So in the sense, if you want to type something in, it does recognize the schema of the entity you're dealing with. You could, if you've used GraphQL endpoint before, you could write multiple queries. So I could, in the same query, pull products as well as assets as other things. You could do like a ton of different things. It just helps you in pulling exactly the information you need. So it's pretty neat and simple. Um, what uh, this query shows is from like a result perspective. Right now, there's not that many products inside of the delivery endpoint. So there's about six. But whereas on the uh, preview endpoint, there'll be more than six because we have quite a few products in here, which we are dealing with. So that's a quick way for you to know which endpoint you're hitting. Uh, from a content Hub perspective, again, I don't know how many of you guys have seen Content Hub before. It's basically split into four. One is called um, PCM, Product Content Management, which is divided into catalogs. Product families are categories. And then you actually have products which have their own schema. Uh, we'll primarily be concentrating on products because the demo is built around it. So we have four product categories over here. And then you have a bunch of products which can belong to uh, quite a few things. As you can see, there are um, uh, indicators over here. So if you see a green arrow, uh, a green cloud with a uh, checkbox, it basically means it was delivered to the content edge. And you can see there's only six. And if, if they are not, then they haven't been pushed to it. In here, I know what state they need to be in order to be pushed. So for each entity, you can set certain attributes. So for instance, this guy was pushed to the experience edge because he's in the approved state. If And the other guys are not pushed because they're not in the approved state and you can control it. Uh, so because this is created, it doesn't get pushed. You can control <clears throat> per entity whether they can make it or not and how they make it. One second. So the delivery platform, which is over here, uh, you can select the different conditions in which a specific entity makes it into the uh, site core experience edge. So for instance, we are first of all mentioning, does this type of entity even need to be on the delivery platform to, so you can first select that. If that is the case, you could add conditions. So for instance, here for an asset, it needs to be a specific lifestyle status. It needs to belong to a specific content repository. If, if your entity has a date field on it, you could utilize that in order to schedule it. So you could say schedule this entity delivery based on a date field I have on a specific entity. In terms of uh, for a product like the one we were looking into, the, the uh, conditions are pretty simple. So as long as the status is approved, it'll get pushed to the delivery platform. If not, it won't. Not all entities are set to go into um, the delivery platform, depending on your need, you might have to turn on and off which one you want, but that's pretty simple. So that's the PCM portion of it. You could do the same exact thing for CMP. CMP, again, if you haven't used it before, um, 
content marketing platform, you could create different types of content. So things like blogs, recipes, news articles, authors, whatever you want to call them. Each one of these, again, you can specify if they can get to the delivery network or not, what the conditions are. Uh, assets, so DAM, uh, digital asset management, is the other one instead of Content Hub. By default, all these assets are capable, so that you'd, Experience Edge doesn't expose assets per se because assets by default are separate. They are, you get them through the delivery endpoints of the DAM itself. So what you are getting uh, with the Experience Edge are all the products and all the CMP data. The other one, the last piece of content um, hub is MRM. And it's mainly like a JIRA and Confluence for marketing content. So you can manage everything from ideation all the way to production. Let me come back here. So yeah, so it's kind of nice. Um, to have all of this data, pull it as fast as you can and use anything you like in order to deliver it. Um, personally, if I have to choose which option, um, at least off late, it's been pretty much everything which can let me do an omni-channel delivery. Uh, what I mean by that is build your content in one place and deliver it into multiple channels. So for the longest time, we've been stuck in the W part of the CMS, which is web CMS perspective, which is we look at everything from deliver to the web, which is great. Uh, and that is one of the biggest channels we push to, but over the years, things have changed. We push to mobile uh, as a native mobile app or mobile notifications. We push to gaming devices. We push to IOT devices. There's several, uh, you syndicate content, which is not truly web, so they can take the content and use it in, in any delivery platform they choose to. So over a period of time, the concept of web-only content changed a lot into omni-channel, and Content Hub is one of um, a few options you can use in order to deliver your content uh, in an omni-channel way. My personal preference is to choose, um, you know, store your content in Content Hub, use the GraphQL endpoint, so Sitecore Experience Edge to put your content out there. And then I, I personally love using Next.js and Marcel. So I am not a JS person. I am, I've been primarily doing .NET for the entire life lifetime. Before that, it was VB and God knows what. Um, so for me, it was a huge step trying to get into next year. But once you do get into it and look at how seamless things are and how you don't have to worry about deployments, how you don't have to worry about half the things we worry about in the regular monolith CMS space, life is just easier. And this shows up in several different ways in terms of like speed, cost, and ultimately the customers and the end clients benefit. So that would be my my choice of deployment if I had a uh, choice in, in the Sitecore space. So this next slide is, it says why. None of the content on here is my own. I pulled everything from Sitecore, so I didn't make anything up. The first two say the same thing. And I, like I mentioned previously, I can fill the entire slide with just that one message. And that that is what you need to drive everything based off of, which is, Omnichannel, the content production and delivery is how the industry is going, whether you like it or not. It's either you fall in line or you wait and you fall behind. Um, again, doing it this way gives you and the marketing teams, your customers, uh, independence to build it whichever way they want. One of the biggest benefits of going this way is you can build sites in the Jamstack architecture you can have independent teams working on independent things. Deliveries are faster. You can turn on a dime. You no longer have the resource crunch of finding a, an, an actual site core developer because now you can find, you know, one of your marketing teams can use a React team they have to do it. The other one can use Angular. The other one can use a .NET Core in order to do it. So in general, this is just pure and simple, much easier, faster, cheaper to deploy your thing. Uh, on top of that, being able to have the content modeling aspect of uh, Content Hub just gives you greater flexibility in terms of how you produce your content. Uh, before I jump into the demo part of it, 
um, I do want to mention that we have a repository out there with an extra long ass uh, repository name. That's my fault. If it was cameras, it would be something small and sweet. Uh, there's a QR code out there if you want to download the repository. It's completely free. It's open. Pretty every single piece of code which is being used in the demo I'm showing right now has um, is is on that repo. So there's no smoke and mirrors, like I would like to say. Uh, next slide. So one of the things which is interesting is for the longest time. Uh, pretty much on every demo, people keep saying, you know what, uh, this is an emulated version of a mobile app. And uh, we, you know, built it, you can take a look, this is, em we just wanted to actually build a mobile app uh, and have it out there. So this is on my phone. Uh, this is an actual app. Um, of course, Apple rejected the app because they said it didn't have enough functionality, but the Android app is live, so you can use the QR code to download it. So let me show you guys a little bit of a demo. So what I'm gonna do is, so as we mentioned, the demo highly uh, depends on the PCM part of the um, content hub. Uh, we have four product families, so we kind of divided it in such a way that uh, the products, you know, are belong to a certain um, product family, and we have a set of products. As we saw before, we have about six products which are on the delivery. So you can see the preview mode is false, which means we are directly hitting the delivery platform, delivery endpoint, uh, both in the mobile app as well as on the website. We have four. So if we go into preview mode here, and if I get to preview mode there, you can see that we have a lot more uh, products in the preview mode. Um, so that's kind of neat. Uh, what we also did is if I go into uh, a specific um, product, you can see we have the title, we have the image and we have some content. So if I go into this, uh, product over here. What we tried to do and what's kind of interesting is once you get into the mobile space, you can't really use the rich text uh, products the way and rich text content the way you use it on a website. You have to heavily strip it or do a bunch of things in order to use it. So what we decided to do to make things interesting is I'm going to say And then this is a web. We use different fields for different things. So this guy is still in created state. Um, so it will not be pushed to the delivery platform to the delivery API, but we should have it on preview. So we used short description, which is text-based um, in the mobile app. And then the long description, which is um, rich text in the web. Optimally, what should happen is if, uh, you know, in the right headless format, and hopefully soon, uh, Sitecore is going to add this. If you have the portable JSON format for your rich text, it's split up in a way that it can be used by the web as well as it can be used by the mobile. And that's something I believe is coming soon. So hopefully that'll, that'll come through and we can use it. So I just updated this guy uh, to web and mobile. So if I refresh that, as you can see, the web thing comes in. Let me go back here. And then open this guy up again. Uh, the mobile content comes in. So it doesn't take that long to update content and for it to be pushed out. As I mentioned right now, we're using the preview API. So it's pretty quick. Delivery does take a little bit longer because you do have to go through workflow, get it to the right state, and then it gets pushed out to the, the delivery platform. So that's one piece of the demo. So let me get back. So the other part which I wanted to talk about a little bit is um, being able to personalize. So one of the biggest things we hear from marketing teams 
when we kind of talk to them about um, Jamstack or using headless systems or something like a content hub pushing to the site query experience edge, the first question they ask is, is you can personalize on Jamstack, can you? And the answer is, yes, you can. So there's a lot of people out there who knowingly or unknowingly pass BS around saying that you can personalize on Jamstack, which isn't really true. And one of the prime examples is the recent acquisition of Box Server, right? So the, we got an ac access to Box Server. We are actually working on a demo as we speak uh, in order to use uh, Box Server in one of our demos. Um, seems like a really good platform. You have the customer data platform, which aggregates all the data, and then they have segmentation and analytics. And hopefully, pretty soon, I can jump on a user group and then show you guys how Box Server works. But at this moment in time, we just got access to the actual instance, so we're working through it. Uh, but what you can do is you have other platforms. So you could use Google Optimize, you could use Optimizely, you could also use Uniform in order to uh, personalize your content on a Jamstack site or on a headless based platform. Now, a lot of the people in the Sitecore space know Uniform because of the guys who built it because they were part of Sitecore and there is a module out there which lets you use XM with Uniform, but this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Uniform in the headless world where you can use it with any headless CMS, so Content Hub with Experience Edge or Contentful or Content, whatever that is, you can utilize it. And today I'll show you a demo of how that works. So back to this guy again. Uh, let me get in there. So right now, uh, I'm again, it's the same site, not on the same uh, same page, but on the same site. Um, all the source code is still in there. I haven't changed anything in that. From a uniform perspective, uh, what we have is we have a site set up um, for personalization. Uh, in the in the world outside of Sitecore, when you look at personalizations, you talk about intents and you talk about signals. So whether you do optimize or Optimizely or other headless um, personalization providers, they always talk about intent. So what we did in in this you know, in the spirit of all our product families inside of here is for each product family, we set up an intent. Uh, each intent has one signal except the fruitful lemonade. In this one, we have two types of um, signals. One is based on behavior, which is the person going to the actual uh, page where we are recording that, oh, this guy came to Fruitful Lemonade. The second one is based on a query string. So query string, think of it as though if you're doing a Google campaign or a paid ad campaign, you're coming to the site using a query string parameter. So in this case, I'm using UTM campaign. If it equals Lemonade, then I want to make sure this is the strongest signal, which tells me, hey, by the way, this guy is super interested in Fruitful Lemonade. All the other uh, signals are pretty um, the same, like a normal signal based on behavior. What we are going to try to do is that on our site right now, we have a homepage. On the homepage, we are thinking like, okay, for now, I'm going to showcase powerful snack bars as the, as the category. When we look at the intents, as you can see, it recognizes that we have two intents, um, for two signals for fruitful lemonade and one for each of these and we have four intents right now we don't know what this guy likes or what he doesn't like right so i'm going to go into helpful chips and when i do that so all these interior pages which are category pages we are recording their behavior so when they go to that page we're like wait this person likes healthful chips so when i go back home it's going to display whichever version or whichever um, product family we think the person likes based on their behavior, right? So the homepage itself is not recording the behavior. It's showing the personalized piece of content. The internal category pages are recording the behavior. So if I were to go into powerful granola, come back to the homepage, 
right now I have 50 50 so it's like okay you know what this guy probably likes this over something else but if I were to uh, provide a UTM campaign what we noticed when we looked at the uh, signals is that fruitful lemonade was a hundred which was the strongest signal in which case it's like okay fruitful lemonade wins over something else but if i were to go enough times inside of helpful chips right technically based on my behavior i am saying i like helpful chips so it's pretty this is just a simple simple um way of doing things there are ton more th this is only a free version by the way the actual paid version has many more types of signals uh, I would say that based on these signals, you can pretty much do quite a bit of personalization based on what the person is doing, the information the, the person is able to provide. So it's pretty, uh, pretty simple to collect all of that personalization. From a, let me show you from a coding perspective, uh, again, it's pretty simple. Uh, again, I, you guys don't have to be next experts but essentially you uh, install a couple of npm packages which track and show behavior uh, on our home page what we are showing is a uh, we want to show a personalized version of the product category and we don't want to track behavior on the interior pages where we are um, displaying the product category products for a specific category we are saying okay display the product category uh, items but this time track the behavior so essentially when we have track behavior we are calling a method in uniform which says okay right now track it based on the categories intent tag which is basically how you set up intents and on the home page we are just saying okay don't track behavior but show the personalized version of it and that's how simple it is. It's literally like one line to track behavior. And then, so in order to track behavior anywhere, it's just one line and you pass in the intent and to display, you're using the same exact component, but you're saying, give me the personalized version based on the person's behavior. Super simple, it's really, really not difficult whatsoever. Um, and it's easy to set up. There's a lot more intent type signal types um, for a paid version, but we thought this was interesting. They released a new version of the um, of the Chrome plugin. This is a, mine is a little bit of an older version, uh, but the newer version is in the App Store for the extensions uh, for Google Chrome, so you can easily get that and install it uh and and uniform you could get the free version of it with i forget the the limitations but i think you can use a couple of sites with a four uh intents and like six or eight signals i forget uh, again remember all of the code is on here uh, i have a bunch of um, instructions so as long as you have your own content hub with uh, person um Sitecore Experience Edge instance available. You can run through these commands, set the right attributes, and you'll have it up and running within minutes. So it's all pretty much set over there. Kind of explains a little bit about a few of the other things you can do. And this, you can also use this as a base project in order for you to, um, you know, start off your next year's project if that's what you choose to. Because we kind of wired up quite a bit of things based on what we do. So in order to run, make sure it builds, make sure it exports properly, make sure it formats properly, make sure you do some testing, checking before you check it into the repository and also generating intent. So you could, you could do quite a bit of things in there. And again, if you have any questions, I am more than happy to answer them for you guys. Um, hopefully it was informational enough to to grasp it, but the biggest thing is once you get access to the instance, it's easier to play with it and get some understanding. Silence. So if you if you guys have questions, I can I'm more than happy uh, to answer it for you guys.
No one wants to unmute their mic, huh? Um, if that's not the case, then thank you so much for spending your evening and your time to join this user group. And uh, again, even if you have questions after the fact, you want to reach out one-on-one um, -on, -one on Slack, just um, you're more than welcome to ping me. I have, I have a quick question, sorry. I just wanted to make sure I formulated it properly before I asked. So all of this was done in, with uh, Content Hub, which so kind of a over, like as I'm looking into the future and I'm thinking about Sitecore and where they're going, you know, um, XConnect and X that, you know, all of that stuff is, is that disappearing, right? And it, I mean, if everything is going to the edge, <laughs> I mean, is you, all, you want, all of that disappearing? You want an answer as a sitecore person or you want to an answer as a community person? Uh, as a community person. Okay. So as a community person, I think, um, yes, I wouldn't, like, uh, it will eventually go away. You do have to remember there's quite a few clients on both, uh, you know, the XM part of it as well as Content Hub, right? So it won't disappear. But I would imagine as they sign up new customers, the new customers will be more intent on going more of the SaaS and the headless route and maybe end up using Content Hub with Sitecore Experience Edge and maybe even use Box Ever in order to do the personalization rather than going through and setting up infrastructure. The costs are horrible, right? When you compare like an Azure Pass as opposed to a SaaS-based version. So yeah. I, I wouldn't, to me, XConnect and XM are a dying breed of technologies at this moment. Thank you. All right, anyone else? I didn't mention about Box Hour. It's more uh, focused on the personalization aspects. Yeah, it is. So it's it's kind of interesting. So they have um, different types of personalization. You could do like uh, A-B testing, triggered personalization, and a whole bunch of stuff. And it, they seem to be built on scale to begin with. So it, it looks very interesting. Um, they have a lot of analysis in the back end and artificial intelligence, I believe, which I have not tested it yet, but it's supposed to be pretty nice. So oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to integrating that and in to figure out a how difficult it is to integrate it um, and how easy it is to replicate some of the things we're used to from uh, from a setting up perspective. I haven't like implemented it as in implemented it in code, but I did set up some uh, personalization tests. I think I released a blog post last week, but uh, they're pretty nice. You could do A/B testing, multivariant testing, testing based on geos and all kinds of fun stuff. So it's supposed to be really nice. Okay. So I believe if that is the case, then they're going to blend in Content Hub and then use Box Hub for personalization. Yep. And com compare, uh, combine that with 441, 451, or what is it? 451. Yeah, 451. Technically, XP, XM, XC, XConnect. 451 is more related to the commerce side of yeah. things? Or? Yeah, so you, okay. you know, so if you combine all of those, you really don't have any of the traditional headaches anymore. Yeah, totally discard sidecore and just stick to this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Akshay. Any other questions from anyone? I have uh, some basic question. Like I'm a back-end person, like I don't, I, I don't do any of the front-end JavaScript. I, I hate it actually. I mean, not hate it. Like I'm, I haven't done anything on the front end side. So yeah. like, would it be like, how long does it take to like switch the thing to next JS and get the head wrap around in it? I think if you jump into it, you can probably pick it up within a month or so. You would never know it as much as you do .NET, right? It'll take years for you to do that. But I think the idea <laughs> is there's still quite a bit of things you have to do in order to have this. So think about it from a, the content hub with experience search is only giving you content, right? You still got to figure out your search. You still have to figure out, you know, 
where are your farms going to come from? Where is your data going to come from? You still have to do integration. So I wouldn't say that you're done with all the, the backend work. There's still quite a bit of integration, architecture, API work, which needs to get done. Uh, the way I look at this is for us to be next year, so React developers, it'll take a while if you want to jump into that world. But I don't think you totally need to be in that world as long as you know the main concepts and you can troubleshoot. That's the way I would look at it. Got it. Got it. No, th this makes sense. Actually. Yeah. Um, but nice to see the GitHub one. I'm going to download and I'll give it a try for sure. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you guess, do you have access to like an Experience Edge uh, sandbox by any means? Um, we have that style box, uh, style labs uh, one, but I'm not sure about the Experience Edge one. Yeah, it's an add-on on top of that. So you might have to ask your partner rep and they can easily add that on to you. Wow, good to know, good to know. Okay. We'll reach out to them. Awesome. Anyone else, guys? Hearing, uh, sorry, I, I joined a little late. <laughs> As usual, stuck with other meetings. Um, so the experience edge here, so a couple of questions, right? One is the the basic differences between the, the CD that we usually have in our regular website delivery architecture versus this headless architecture with the content hub experience edge and in Jamstack. Uh, the differences, the main differences, other than the SaaS model, uh, did you find any differences between the the CD and the? Experience? Uh, so the CD, you are still having to use the. Um, so the main difference, I think, is the scalability and the cost of scalability to begin with, mm -hmm. um, and how your data is available. Right. So right now, the, if you have a CD. And if I need to build a mobile app, for instance, or like a Jamstack app, without having JSS, if I just add the CDs there, then using the item API, can you do it? You can, but it's just an additional headache. You would much rather just hit the CM and get the data and do it from there, right? Mm -hmm. So from a delivery perspective, it truly depends on who, what use case you're trying to serve. And if it's just a website and that's all it is and your customer is comfortable with the current content strategy as well as the current bill, then I think it, it's fine to be on it. I don't see a reason why you can't be. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think gro going forward, going to a SaaS-based model in terms of cost and delivery and monthly running costs. I think it's much more efficient to run in a SaaS model rather than it is to have um, you know, on-prem or Azure-based PaaS service. Makes sense, thank you. And one of the big ones, of course, is upgrades, right? Like if, you, if there's a new version of Content Hub that gets released, you just get it. There's no need to upgrade a separate set of service yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you.